Well, greetings to the smartest audience out there. Let's take a look at questions that you can ask to help people realize that their foundation is faulty. And let's look at some logical fallacies that they may use. And it's important that you recognize them and realize those are non-answers. And then, and this is based on a real life cor correspondence that I had on Facebook. I was on our ICR's Facebook page and they had a post about the Coconino Sandstone. Water, not wind. And so I commented on that and I said, what a story the Coconino Sandstone tells. And then I post and then I put a link to the Grand Canyon talk that's on the Hydroplate channel on YouTube. Oh, and if you could, go into YouTube and search Hydroplate Conference. That's the only way you can find the channel. You can't find it if you search Hydroplate or Hydroplate Theory. It doesn't show up for whatever reason. If you could just go into Hydroplate Conference, see one of the talks, click on the channel, and if you could like it and share it. That's your, you're just throwing a little pebble in the pond. Throw a little pebble out there. Hopefully we get enough pebbles that they can't ignore the waves that are going to be coming from this theory because it makes accurate predictions. It's got uh, answers, scientific questions. I encourage you to check it out. But if you could do that for me, that'd be a tremendous blessing. And it'll help science progress because right now it's, uh, it's being shunned and that's unfortunate. So I put that comment out there. And then somebody responded. And I put, what a story the Coconino Sandstone tells. And he says, it certainly does. Long periods of erosion, wind blown, dune deposits along an ancient sea. A number of animal tracks are preserved as well in what was damp sand created by morning fogs. Oh, how does he know that? These conditions are found in modern seaside deserts. So my question <laughs> could have been, are those uh, footprints being turned to stone in those deserts too? But I didn't. I asked him, again, questions are powerful, because if they're not answered properly, they don't go away, and hopefully they wake them up at night. So I asked him, why does the Colorado River flow through the plateau instead of around it to form Grand Canyon? And he responded, because the meandering river cut down through the rock as the land slowly rose, preserving the meanders. This, that last part is critical to understand the events. The river slowly meandered across the area and then was trapped in those meanders as the land rose slowly enough for the river erosion to keep up. It's like, how does he know that? And I encourage you to stop, you know, after his response is push pause, pause and see how you might respond to this guy. And I respond, it sounds like a just so story like the evolutionists use. Like, oh, dinosaurs turned into birds. That's just a just so story. There's no evidence for that at all. And I, should, I, could, I should have asked him, hey, how did the side canyons form? There's no river. If the river carved the canyon, what carved the side canyons, which are just as deep, with no river? But I didn't. I asked him, where did the 800 cubic miles of sediment go? And he responds, down the Colorado River, building land and into the sea, the way all river systems work. And he says, I suggest that you take an introductory geology course. It will explain the basics of your erosion, deposition, landforms, etc. Smiley face. And I responded, the Colorado River is not big enough for the Grand Canyon erosion. Try again. Yeah, because Grand Canyon, that's 800 cubic miles of sediment that's gone. And if you take all the rivers in the world together, they've had 300 miles of erosion, 300 cubic miles of erosion. So it's not nearly, the delta is not nearly big enough. And so I said, try again. And he said, and out to sea, try again. The Grand Clan Canyon was clearly cut slowly. Rapid deposition would not have preserved the meanders. It is quite obvious and simple. It's basic geology. Take that geology course. So I responded, another just so story. The delta is too small. And then I asked another question. Why did the river cut into the hard crystalline rock instead of cutting wider into the softer sedimentary rock at the inner gorge? And he responds, it did both. Depending on location, there's a lot of sediments in that river. Excellent for cutting through any natural material. And so again, why didn't it cut wider instead of deeper? It was softer that way. And I responded, 1,200 feet deep, because that's how deep that inner gorge is. 1,200 feet through that crystalline rock. I said the sediment and boulders on the bottom protect the bottom from eroding. And I should have kept on that point. You know, why did it dig deeper instead of wider? But I moved on. How did potholes form on a 2,000-foot cliff? And he responds, the sediments, like boulders, are washed along and erode the channel further. 
The river bottom is not protected from erosion. It erodes constantly, more during floods. And that's not what I heard on Brian Nichols' tape and on Real Science Radio. If I recall, there's like 75 feet of sediment at the bottom of that river full of boulders and all that stuff, and maybe the top 10 or 15, 20 feet of it moves in a flood, but the bottom's protected. It's not cutting deeper into the canyon anymore. And I responded, it's cutting wider, not deeper. And then I went back to, how did potholes form on a 2,000-foot cliff? And he responds, it most certainly is cutting deeper. Stop being silly. Show me the potholes. And I responded, are you making comments without watching the video? That explains a lot. I said, see the 550 mark of the YouTube link. And he responds, do you realize that I've been a professor, professional geologist for more than 40 years? So he's blowing his horn. And I've known about Walt Brown and his incredible fantasies the whole time. So he's casting shade at Walt Brown. I don't need to see another video about hydroplates. Don't need more of that flood nonsense. It's a fantasy. The world doesn't work that way. Physics doesn't work that way. Well, I would suggest physics does work that way. <laughs> I mean, Walt Brown, he's got his PhD from MIT. He's, he understands physics. You need a, you, capital letters, need a basic introductory geology course. It would give you a solid background that might keep, keep you from being misled by such fraudulent nonsense. Another ad hominem. Basically, hydroplate theory is balderdash. Stick with real science. Okay, so he's, he's said a lot right there. You know, and he's blown his soul. What basically he says, he's, a, he's appealing to authority, his own authority. I've done this for 40 years. I know more than you. Walt Brown's a nut, even though he's got a PhD from MIT, and his work is all balderdash. So a lot of ad, ad hominems, a lot of, uh, what do they call it, elephant to the tossing. So I responded, appeal to authority doesn't answer how potholes formed on a 2,000-foot cliff four miles from the river. Could you try again? So basically, I just kind of ignored all his Ed Hahnemann stuff and called out his illogical fallacy of appeal to authority and uh, try again. And he says, which potholes where? Picture? And I said, see previous comment with timestamp. And I did look up his page. I looked up his background. And yeah, he was a, he's a retired geologist and he was at a uh, geological survey. And then I, I asked him another question. Since he's got all that experience, I basically asked, could you be wrong? Could the consensus be wrong? Could it be possible that the consensus is wrong? He, resp Robert, he responds, highly unlikely, given that all the evidence points to that consensus. Well, I would disagree. I would say all the evidence points to the hydroplate. You know, all the, there's a bunch of just stories, just throw, just so stories that the consensus has. And so I responded, evolutionists think all the evidence points to evolution, too. And there's a lot of holes in that theory. How did potholes, and I bring it back to the, uh, the question, how did potholes form 3,300 feet above the river on a 2,000-foot cliff and four miles from the river? And he says, doesn't sound like a problem. If they are potholes, any stream, whether continuously flowing or seasonal, can form potholes in its channels. Well, this is four miles from the th river, by the way. Or are you talking about brachia pipes, as mentioned above? Since you've provided no description, pictures, etc., I can't give you any details. And so I have to remind him. What makes you think the potholes are brachia pipes? Have you been there? And I told him where you can see the pictures. See this 420 and 2206 of the Rumble link. And I asked him, have you been there? And he says, yes, I've been there four times, all the way in and out twice. You obviously haven't been there, or you'd have a better idea of the whole area. Potholes are common in many places. There's no surprise in finding them along the GC water that routinely flows into the canyon and probably more frequently during the Pleistocene than today. Your problem is that you are stuck on what this one group claims because of their religious beliefs rather than the vast amount of data collected by thousands and thousands of professional geologists. You need to pull your head out of this group's twisted view and see everything else. So he's getting, um, let's see, a little less professional here. Let's just say that. He's been there, and I had a bunch of comments I was going to think. And then I noticed that I've been there four times. There is in quotation marks. Do you see that? All the way in and all the way out twice. And what was I referring to there? I was referring to the potholes on that cliff. 
Have you been there? So I asked him, where is, quote, there, unquote? Why is that word in quotes? Did you personally go to the pothole on Echo Cliffs that is on a 2,000 foot cliff, which is shown from 430 to 448 of this video? And he responds, I, I watched a few parts of that ridiculous video. My suggestion is take an introductory geology course. And so he threw up a red herring saying, yeah, it's a ridiculous video. He's not answering the questions, and it's another ad hominem. He's telling me, I don't know what I'm talking I need to take the classes so I can get educated. So I responded, red herring and then ad hominem. I point that out, and then I respond, it appears that you deceptively said you were, quote, there, unquote, at the pothole. Once again, did you personally go to the pothole on Echo Cliffs that is on a 2,000-foot cliff, which is shown from 430 to 448 of this video? My suggestion, watch the whole video with an open mind so you will know what you are commenting upon. And he responds, My advice to you is get an actual education in the subject matter rather than rely on deliberately distorted YouTube video. I never said I was at the potholes. My slow-minded friend. So that's another ad hominem, you know, calling name calling. And so I don't respond. I just, you know, ad hominem again. See comments above, and then I copy and paste the comments. Question, what makes you think the potholes are brachia pipes? Have you been there? Answer, yes, I've been there four times. Why didn't you honestly say no? And what, what is distorted on the video? Did you watch all of it? And he responds, there meant the Grand Canyon, my slow friend. Okay, so he's calling names again. Tell you what. I want you to take introductory courses in basic physical and historical geology as well as a course in sedimentology and plate tectonics. Get back to me when you can discuss the subject intelligently. So again, he's avoiding the question. And so I respond very deceptive to answer a different question than the specific topic being discussed. Would your, And then I ask him, you know, he tells me, get all this education, take all these classes. And so then I bring up another question, and this is really my ace in the hole. I don't know how he's going to explain this one. Would your suggested courses be able to explain a five-ton rock lifted into sedimentary rock? C248 of this video. And then he responds, I'll talk to you about after your education. The problem with folks like you is that the less you know, the more certain you are that you are right. Drop the religious fantasy and get an education. Okay, so he's ignoring the question altogether, and he's just taking pot shots at me, saying, I don't know what I'm talking about, and I've got a religious fantasy, and get an education, right? So how would you respond to that? Seriously, how would you respond to somebody that's saying that to you? Why well, just kind of uh, hold a, held a mirror up to him? I just said this. So your courses can't explain how a five-ton quartzite rock got lifted into sedimentary rock. And then I go after what he told me to do. And why should anyone get educated with courses that can't explain this rock? Will we learn how to attack opposing ideas with just so stories, deception, ad hominem, and red herring fallacies too? I mean, that's what he's been doing this whole time. It's not very professional, and it's rather embarrassing. And I put, and he's saying, I'm believing fantasies, so I hold this up to him. It is, is it possible that you've been indoctrinated into believing the fantasy of nothing exploded and turned into everything? I don't have enough faith to believe that fairy tale, because that's what the Big Bang is. Nothing explodes, and here we are. I don't have enough faith to believe that fairy tale. So I'm throwing some stuff right back at him. By the way, NASA made a catastrophic blunder based on that dogma because the hydroplate warning was ignored. And then I linked them to the comment talk that's on uh, the YouTube channel. And so I just pretty much held the mirror up to him, what he's been doing, you know. Will we learn how to attack opposing ideas with just so stories? He did. Deception? He did. Ad hominem and red herring fallacies. So is that what the education is going to turn me into? Man, I don't want any part of that, is basically what I'm saying. And so what was his response? It was nothing. He actually deleted all of his comments, every one of them. Oh, there might have been one that he left, but he deleted everything else. And so I took a screenshot of these, and it's like, wow. And then I thought, man, it would have been neat to have all his comments before he deleted them. And so I went into the Wayback Machine, 
And so now you can see the correspondence that we had that Robert's rather embarrassed about, I would guess, or he would have left him up there for the world to see. But, uh, but basically, he was deceptive, and he did a lot of logical fallacies. And this is a professional geologist. So this hydroplate theory is solid. It's not because I'm smarter than him. I'm probably not. But I'm right. This theory predicts things. It explains things. And I encourage you to watch the Grand Canyon talk. It's uh, Grand Canyon Answers on Rumble, on the hydro, hydro, Rumble hydroplate theory. And on YouTube, again, you're going to have to go into YouTube conference to find it. It's uh, the origin of Grand Canyon. And also, if you want even more of these, it's hydroplate.org. Get all this information. And again, this guy is a 40-year geologist, experienced, but he's got the wrong foundation. And I was able to ask questions he couldn't answer, so he started using fallacies and then hominems and just basing uh, appealing to authority. So again, there are questions out there. And just keep sticking to the questions. And when they give you ad, hom ad hominems, just point them out. And keep going, asking questions, asking questions. And this is one way <laughs> that we silenced the uh, Grand Canyon expert.